Welcome back to the channel, doing another reaction today. And if you like this type of content and want some more content like this, hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you're new to the channel. We're on our way to 20,000 subscribers. We have done amazing these past two years. Let's see how far we can go within this next year. And if you guys want to go even farther, support me on Patreon or become a member. Link in the description below. Follow me on every social media platform you probably can. For something very, very interesting. This is by a channel called Illuminati. <laughs> Naughty. Scrolling through YouTube, and I came across this video. I don't know what this channel is. I don't know anything they do, but they can't... I, I, I was very interested by the title of this video. It's something I was curious about a lot, too. TV ghost hunting is a scam. So, things like Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Hunters International, all of that stuff is just one giant scam. Actually, this morning, I was filming a video talking about my personal issues with Zach Baggins. Now, I'm not sure if I'll release that video or not. Maybe I'll make it a Patreon exclusive video. I don't know. It's just kind of me going on a rant on certain things that I find a bit very interesting with Zach Baggins and maybe his museum. You know, because if you know me, you know who I am. You know that I'm very skeptical when it comes to content creators putting out paranormal videos because I myself, yes, have experienced paranormal uh, encounters and I have seen things that I cannot explain. I really want answers, but I do know for a fact that a lot of content creators fake shit for views, and I know it's a real thing. I know for a fact it's a real thing. So, we're about to dive into this, and I'll give you guys my personal opinions during and after the video, but if you have anything you want to leave in the comments down below, absolutely leave them in the comments down below. There are some things in this world that we just don't have explanations for. Absolutely. Sure, while there's probably a logical reason, other times we'd like to imagine stranger and more horrifying possibilities, like ghosts. Humans have pretty much believed in ghosts since the beginning of time. An article from The Conversation says this belief is from prehistoric times, all the way back to our caveman instincts. It's truly impossible Ooh. to know what got us thinking about ghosts, but we've been trying to solve the mystery of are they real and can we prove it for eons. In the 19th century, during the peak of spiritualism, seances were all the rage and Ouija boards were increasingly popular. Those that wanted to talk to ghosts weren't just on the fringes of society, but many of them were actually scientists. The Society for Psychial Research or SPR was established and filled with mathematicians, scholars, and authors among their early members. That's not to say that scholars can't be ghost hunters today, but that's not really the vibe you get from watching those types of shows. Right, now, right. Now, modern ghost hunting has taken on a different turn. A couple people with a camera typically go into an old, supposedly haunted location and jump at the slightest sound. Eerie suspenseful Ghost hunters, music plays, yeah. and it makes the show into a sort of found footage horror movie and weird noises, cold spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and if you ever, if you guys ever watch my videos, by the way, I'm actually kind of enjoying the commentary. But this is something I have said several times with videos like Sam and Colby, for example. I have said this with them. Sometimes when they add too much music, it really doesn't even feel like we're taking it seriously anymore. It feels like I'm watching a film and a found footage movie more than it does actually watching a real paranormal investigation trying to figure out answers. So yeah, I, I actually, that's kind of the same feel. That's kind of the same thing, I think. Thoughts and bad feelings fill the program. Yeah. The equipment used like thermal imaging cameras and EMF readers seem legit. So, hey, who are you as an audience member to argue with the cold hard science, right? What else could possibly be the reason for a figure crossing in front of a thermal camera? It just has to be a ghost. There's no other explanation. Hell, even if you know it's exaggerated, it's still entertaining. Like listening to a ghost story around a campfire, except you're seeing it play out on your TV. However, mm -hmm. more and more in recent years, these programs are getting called out for being transparently fake. Longtime paranormal investigators have specifically called out the TV programs on ghost hunting, accusing them of being unrealistic among other things. Amico, the founder of AZ Paranormal Investigations and Research Society, says that a guy claiming he felt something touch him or a door slamming off camera is the easiest stuff to fake because there's no way to prove its validity. Plus, most of the ghost hunting programs out there- I remember when I got so much flack for saying that, yes, you could shut a door even knowing you're not looking at the door. I got so much hate for that whole Colby thing where he was in that video, Scariest Night of His Life, and the door shuts behind him, like directly behind him, and he freaks out. His reaction was genuine. I felt like it really did happen. But then we go to the same door a little bit later, and we have a video camera pointed at it, and the door shuts again. But the problem with that was there was an air conditioner in front or behind that door as it was open. For all we know, a gust of wind could have came in through the air conditioner and blew that door shut. 
So it, there's a lot of reasonable explanations for things, and they didn't bother going back up and trying to debunk that. They didn't sit in front of the air conditioner and see if there was wind going through it or not. They just kind of said, you know, that's crazy that the door shut again. When we could have gone back to that door and really dissected it, but we just didn't do that. And maybe they did. Maybe they have extra footage on the Explore Club thing they do, but I, I didn't see any of that, so. There are based on experiences from cast and crew instead of cold hard evidence. Some don't even feel faked, but just straight up ridiculous. With a crew of British paranormal series that was called Most Haunted, they were trying to capture a vengeful spirit of a pet monkey in an episode. And I guess no the kidding. pet monkey in this scenario was upset that it was separated from its master. And it's hilariously bad. So one of the hosts, Derek, also tapped into spirits or got possessed during filming. Like, maybe it's just me, but seeing him shout nonsense like ick ed at the camera doesn't convince me that ghosts are real. Apparently, one time after chanting Mary loves Dick on repeat, Mary loves Dick. Richard, or Dick being the spirit, the crew burst out laughing and the raw footage was released, effectively proving that the whole thing was faked. The best bit of that was Mary loves Dick. And I'm sorry, Derek, I know he passed away a couple of years ago, so hey, if nothing else, it was entertaining. But it's the it was. Ghost yeah, that was entertaining. That seemed to start it all, and it triggers this tidal wave of paranormal programming. Wow, Ghost Hunters, though. I The first few seasons, man, were awesome. And I remember there was an episode where, and I was a bit on the, you know, the first few seasons of Ghost Hunters, I actually really do believe they actually caught some really good evidence. Uh, there was even an episode where they go into this, like, diner, and the whole diner faked it. Like, this whole place faked it. They had, a like, a, a fake face behind the mirror and stuff, and they were just wanting to pull a prank on the Ghost Hunters team, and they were pissed off. They walked, what is this, a fucking joke to you? And, dude, I, I really respected them after that video. I really did, because I was like, damn, they really do not like it when people fake shit, but then people can change. I mean, money can do a lot to people to where they would be like, yeah, let's go ahead and add some sound effects in, make it more make it more interesting and make it more scary for the audiences, and now bring more people on in. And that is something that a lot of paranormal investigators at some point led to, was just faking shit, just for view purposes. And it's, it's sad, because you really did like them at some point. Salon's written an article stating that real life ghost hunters consider the TV program Ghost Hunters the bane of their existence. The supposed real ones call themselves parapsychologists and consider themselves to be more like the modern day SPR. They search for evidence and at one point even received grants for their work to study hauntings. Now, ever since TV ghost hunters have entered the arena, the yeah. demand for parapsychologists has plummeted while the accusations of fakery and bad science have skyrocketed. So what has happened to modern day ghost hunting? Is any element of these TV programs real? And will we ever really find proof that ghosts exist this way? High tech hunting, yeah, some of this technology. Hello and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati and today we are of course going to be talking about ghost hunting the tech, the fakery, the truth, and everything in between. Now that we know just a okay. little bit about how ghost hunting is seen today, let's get into how it's done and start discussing the technology. According to The Atlantic, technological failure has helped spark the ghost hunting movement since the 1860s. Back in 1861, William Mumler, a jeweler's engraver, was studying a brand new trade of photography when a shadowy figure appeared on a plate he was developing. Mumler was fully aware it was an error. He hadn't sufficiently scrubbed the plate he was using of its previous exposure. Yet Mumler showed his spiritualist friend anyway and passed it off as real. His friend, as someone who believed in spirits and ghosts, was fascinated and believed him. Pretty soon, spiritualists everywhere called the picture proof of death. And when Mumler realized that he could make a pretty penny off these people, he said he'd discovered a phenomenon and started charging people for his photos. You all know those old timey sepia photos depicting ghosts that just have to be real because they were created in the days before Photoshop? Well, someone like Mumbler exists. And so yeah, a form of Photoshop did exist back then in its own unique form. Caitlin from Ask a Mortician has actually posted a whole video about this technique on her channel and how it can be recreated. And it is a fascinating watch. I absolutely recommend it. Okay. But let's face it, those kinds of photos wouldn't be enough proof for the modern day person, right? Like they're just too easy to fake and to lie about. Hell, I'm sure there's probably a filter out there on Snapchat or TikTok or something that could make like a probably. ghost appear too. Probably, yeah. Bit by bit, the technology around ghost hunting has leveled up the longer it's been around. Back in the 1950s, a woman's ghostly face supposedly appeared in a family's television and wouldn't disappear, even after the TV was turned off. 
A few years later, Fuck a that. painter and filmmaker claimed he heard the voices of his deceased wife and father on his cassette recorder. Today, there are a few set things ghost hunters seem to use and rely on. A voice recorder to capture EVP or electronic voice phenomena. A camera is obviously used to capture any blurs, faces, or even orbs in the vicinity. An EMF or electromagnetic field detector as ghosts can apparently give off. And I know a lot of you guys have actually like messaged me and actually commented on my videos explaining how you really do not trust these modern day bits of technology that they use for ghost hunting. And it's like, I could see why some people probably wouldn't. It doesn't seem like it's that hard to malfunction one of these things. So I can, I can completely understand, you know, all it takes, it could be a little bit of dust that hits the, um, oh gosh, dang it. What is it called? Uh, I'm about to have a fucking brain aneurysm, but not the EMF, not the EMF, but the, the little radar thing that, you know, if you just move past it or you like, you barely touch it, it goes off. I, I, off for some reason can't think of it. Fields. An infrared thermometer to show temperature changes. And then of course, a spirit box that can scan radio frequencies box, and create yeah. white noise that a ghost can use to communicate. But is this science actually proven? Well, let's take a look at these gadgets and see. Spirit boxes, yeah. We'll start with the EVP recordings and spirit boxes because those are along the same vein. You're trying to communicate with a ghost by talking to it. Sorry. The first issue I have with EVP seems like a pretty obvious one, the language barrier. If a ghost hunter wanders into a remote location in Japan or an ancient castle in Italy, does it make any sense whatsoever for that ghost to respond to them in English? It's flat out ridiculous and unbelievable. I think that English speakers may hear an English response, but that doesn't mean the ghost is actually saying that. Supernatural Magazine has explained this away with the universal mind theory, stating that every creature upon death has access to the universal mind or the knowledge of everything that has ever lived. And Past, I mean, present, if future, we think yeah. that's possible, then why wouldn't these ghosts also have the knowledge of how to prove that they're real? Wouldn't these ghosts, if they really have infinite wisdom and knowledge as the theory goes, be doing far more than wandering their old houses and telling tourists to get out? It kind of I, it's difficult to really answer. The only real way you ever find out is when you die. That's basically, it's like, uh, this is theorizing. And though I don't mind theories and everything like that, I also find it that we won't ever know until we are actually dead. It, it gives us something to look forward to, doesn't it? We'll find out at some point, but not until then, we're just kind of guessing. And that's pretty much what the whole world of the paranormal is, is just guessing what these things could be. We'll never know. And more than likely, yeah, we'll never ever know, but it, until you die and then you figure out, oh, these are what those were. That's what that was. Oh, okay, okay. And that's how I like to believe it. It's the unknown and we just don't know anything. Seems like a cop out to me. But let's say these ghosts are talking to us using EVP. How do we know that they're saying anything? Well, the short answer is we don't. We Even don't. if we assume that right. these sounds are not deliberate fraud, which is a pretty big assumption in of itself, getting rid of confirmation bias is practically impossible. If you show a paranormal researcher a recording of what they believe to be a ghost, of course you're probably going to get something spooky out of it. Hell, even if you show it to a regular John Smith, that can happen too. According to The Conversation, research in mainstream psychology has shown that people will readily perceive words in strings of nonsensical speech sounds. People's expectations about what they're supposed to hear can result in the illusory perception of tones, nature sounds, machine sounds, and even voices when only acoustic white noise, like the sound of a detuned radio, exists. Studies show that the suggestion of a paranormal research topic when listening to ambiguous EVP recordings makes mm. participants substantially more likely to hear voices. Plus, even if people do hear voices, it's pretty rare that anyone can agree on what they're actually saying. If yeah, it's that's captioned, true. like many of these ghost hunting programs do, then sure, someone can be suggestible to believe that it's saying that. But deciphering it in the first place is an entirely different story. It reminds me of pareidolia, or our instinct to see faces in everyday objects. It's why those windows on the eerie house down the block look like they have eyes, and why your Aunt Marjorie insists that she's seen Jesus' face in a potato chip. Our brains are often looking for faces, and in this case, our ears are listening for voices too. And I was guilty of that when I was younger too. Um, Illuminati, I was guilty of it. I really was. We took pictures around the house and we would see like the smallest little glimmer that could have been just dust. And I'd be like, oh my God, it's a cat. That looks just like a cat. It's just our, it's just our minds trying to make sense of what we're seeing. And it's not always the case. It's not. That's just how this world is. We just, we want to, we want to kind of make things creepy in a sense. We kind of want to make things like, whoa, no kidding. It's just how our minds work. 
That doesn't mean that no voice whatsoever exists, but calling it proof of a ghost is a bit of a stretch too. Apparently, there's also a rich history of using methods to examine auditory perception, making EVP little more than pseudoscience. It's not that the people who believe they truly hear ghost sounds are idiots, especially as how the BBC puts it. No, They're no. just taken in by techniques that have been known to fool us all and the tricks that EVP can play on our minds. Spirit boxes, which scan radio frequencies to try and capture a ghost voice, work using similar concepts. And that's in the fact that you'll hear someone talking to you in the mix of all the jumbled voices. But what about the other tools that ghost hunters use? We talked about EVP, now what about EMF? You see, this is kind of why I like the Estes method. The Sam and Colby equipment that they use, the Estes method, I feel like is actually, it really feels genuine. Like everything that they say is going exactly with what they are wanting to hear in some cases, not, not all the time. And, um, and it just sort of makes sense. Like that's exactly what you would think the spirits of that place would say. But all this other equipment she's mentioning is I'm very skeptical of, I, I am. EMF readers, otherwise known as electromagnetic field readers, were designed to locate potentially harmful radiation from power lines or household appliances. You can still use it for this purpose, but these things are, and there's really no other word for it, a mess. They're unshielded, yeah. so they can be set off by cell phones, watches, radios, basically anything that gives off EM waves. It's very erratic, and it's very prone to false positives and easily manipulated. The Atlantic refers to one interviewer, Kenny Bibble, who went into great detail on his website in 2014 as to how these things work. As shown on his site, the EMF is just made of a case, a circuit board, battery, and some LED lights. Sometimes a simple design is better. Don't fix what isn't broken, right? Other times, simple can also just mean easy to mess around with. Kenny writes that the EMF reader gained notoriety after the third season of Ghost Hunters, when the hunters said they could communicate with ghosts via LED lights. Quote, in an episode covering an investigation of the Manson murders, Grant Wilson states, the K2 meter measures magnetic fields and it's been specially calibrated for paranormal investigators. Kenny retorts, I have yet to uncover exactly how this device could possibly be specially calibrated for paranormal investigators, <laughs> but he's on TV, so he must be right, right? The statement is not only false, it's absurd. He also adds that applying just enough pressure on the power switch of the device with only a tiny bit of contact would actually make the LEDs dance crazily or flash twice on a consistent basis. Does this mean that every single ghost hunter is maliciously button mashing to make you believe a oh. lie? I wouldn't even go that far. It's possible that some no. novice ghost hunters are using it simply because it's a standard in their industry and don't recognize the flaws in the system. I'm sure there are those with malicious intent too, but we can't know for sure. As a whole, it just seems like we really shouldn't be reliant on- Kind of going back to what I said, there are some people who are completely aware of how to really fool people and strings. And trust me, it's not even your guy, it's not even the people's fault who believe in some of this stuff. It's just that is how good we have gotten at doing it. So yeah, I, I, every, every paranormal investigation I watch, I'm always going in there in the back of my mind with a smidgen, a little slim, slim knowledge of just, I could be being fooled right now. And that's just kind of something I'm just gonna let happen. So if it's straight up, but like it looks fake, I do call it out. I do, and I'm not afraid to do that. I know I get hate for it. I get shat on because I call things out sometimes and I know why people hate on me. I know that they are hardcore fans of some of these YouTubers and I understand that they love some of these YouTubers to death and in their minds, there's no way in hell that they could ever lie to them. I, I genuinely believe that there are some content creators who probably do things to amp up their own content a little bit. And that's just that's just me. But I'm not trying to call anybody a liar. I'm not trying to call anybody, you know, a fucking false content creator and or nothing like that. I'm just that is how my mind works. Because I have been lied to and I have caught in some bullshit. This technology in the slightest because of how faulty it is. And yet yep. it's seen as a standard for ghost hunters. EMF readers are arguably more known for being ghost hunter equipment than actual tools at this point. Like seriously, if you go online looking to buy one of these, two out of the top three best-selling readers are explicitly marked as ghost yeah. readers. Yeah. Now, though this article was written in 2016, if you go on Amazon today and just search EMF reader, almost all of them have ghost hunting or paranormal research meter somewhere in the title. There are other somewhat similar devices too, like an RE the REM pod, pod that I was has talking its about own REM electromagnetic pod. field and will react when anything comes near it. 
Skeptics have similar complaints about the REM pod and our good old friend Kenny Bibble seems to argue that the sheer basis of these devices are flawed. He wrote that he couldn't even find a standard definition for electromagneticity. And when he asked Jonathan Vanover, a doctor of computer science, what that term meant, Vanover told him it looked like, quote, a made up word, nothing more than electromagnetic with the word icity added in at the end. And fun fact, adding the suffix icity, which is defined as denoting a quality or condition to an actual term doesn't actually make you smart or legitimate, but these gadget lovers may not have gotten that memo. Unsurprisingly, when Kenny took the REM pod apart, it once again had really basic features that could be easily manipulated. Hell, when you dig into it, the REM pod looks like a vibration activated light sphere, which is more accurately a cat toy that's been repurposed for ghost hunters. And I'm sorry, but if you're gonna market a device to detect ghosts, then it maybe needs to be impenetrable to the outside world. According to- Isn't that crazy? A literal cat toy that's been just uh, referred to as a cat toy and you're paying almost 200 bucks for it. Good golly. Kenny, even when he was walking around on a different floor, this REM pod would be set off pretty easily and purposefully. So you're gonna tell me that a whole camera crew for a television show would not be able to set it off? One former ghost hunter has downright stated that yes, these pods can be set off at will. And even if the data gathered isn't nefarious, it can't possibly be seen as empirical proof either. There's also the matter of these devices setting each other off. A two-way radio can trigger a REM pod, for example. Therefore, it seems pretty possible that ghost hunters with a shit ton of equipment are just tripping their own devices with their other devices. And I'd love to be proven wrong, but unless these reality shows are going to tear open their little ghost boxes and explain how they actually work and how they're protected against interference, I'm more inclined to believe that it's just a reality show misusing devices for entertainment than any proof of a ghost. Sipping on that coffee. Orbs, yeah, this is a big one. And Another pictures, thing that yeah. is consistently recognized as proof of ghosts is orbs. Cameras not focusing, strange balls of light being shown in photos, things of that nature. Some sites like Color Psychology will even tell you what the orbs mean. White is a divine energy, solid black is negative, bright orange is protective, and bright green is something that comes to you if you need healing and so on and so forth. I now, don't buy if that. if you believe in uh. this, that's totally up to you. I'm not going to say that all spiritual beliefs are garbage or anything. However, treating an orb as an indisputable evidence of a ghost or spirit might- it, it, Depending on the camera, it could just be a bug piece of dust. I mean, there's a lot of things you have to consider before thinking of ghosts. Now, depending on how it forms and everything, it might be different, but like, yeah, it, it could be a camera malfunction. You just never know. You just never might know. just be crossing a line from believing in energies to downright misinformation. And the claims surrounding these orbs have been widely exaggerated for years now. Yeah. So first and foremost, let's get to something that's pretty obvious when you go to any old or supposed haunted place. There's dust, dirt, and insects. And those can exactly. all work as viable explanations as to how these supposed orbs show up. And before you say, oh, but I never see that many orbs in my house. Well, hopefully your home isn't as dirty as some crumbling castle or a graveyard or abandoned building. It makes exactly. sense that those places are going to be full of dust. I actually really appreciate this one ghost tour site called Colonial Ghosts because even they admit that orbs are not real proof and we should stop considering them as such. They mentioned dust, pollen, insects, foreign material on a camera lens, and even drops of liquid in the air from high humidities as the cause of orbs. Plus, when you change the settings of a camera to adapt to the dark or use a camera with night vision as most ghost hunting takes place at night, that can also up the chances you'll see orbs as some sort of ghostly image. Even sites like American Hauntings that you'd think would talk all about these orbs being evidence are debunking them. Troy Taylor wrote over a decade ago on the site that the vast majority of orb photos can be blamed on low resolution and low pixel mm -hmm. cameras. Yep. Both Taylor as well as Colonial Ghosts make it a point to say that these orb photos were rare before the invention of the digital camera. Researchers have even gone to cemeteries with both film and digital cameras, taking photos of the exact same location. And sure enough, it's the latter that's filled with these orbs not because the digital cameras are better at capturing the ghosts, but reflections off dust particles with their flash and things of that nature help to bring those things into focus when it's really nothing more than just that. Dust, specks of dirt, whatever, but. Again, I, again, I'm not, I never jump out of my seat when I see an orb, I never do. It's kind of good though that a lot of these websites, it kind of is encouraging that, yeah, we're trying to actually kind of cut away. And this is not a bad thing, folks. This is, I think, actually a good thing that we're trying to cut away the bullshit from the real evidence. And I, I like that. 
I like that people are starting to realize, okay, orbs are just, or they're not really paranormal. They can be dust, uh, malfunctions. They could be low quality cameras. They, th I'm glad that we're finally kind of in the, cutting the fat out to get to the meat. You know what I mean? Not so, those. yeah. Yet everyone from the Long Island medium on TLC to paranormal researchers featured on news outlets to ghost inclined YouTubers like Graveyard Girl have all implied or questioned if these orbs are paranormal in nature. Proving mm. that a ghost exists is a daunting task and likely even an impossible one. And I don't think that some sort of cat toy lighting up in different colors or some dust floating across a camera should be seen as evidence. Like, I'm sorry, but unless these ghost hunters can definitively tell me what they captured isn't explained away by a normal occurrence, my brain just isn't going to jump to, oh yeah, that's a ghost right there. Like, I'm sorry, you, you gotta prove it on a reasonable doubt. That's your job as a paranormal investigator, isn't it? So then why are you using dinky, pathetic, cheap EMF readers that are so easily manipulated? And again, maybe this is just me. Maybe there's more to this equipment that I'm just not getting, but as it stands, I'm pretty unconvinced. Thankfully though, you can, I'm yeah, not alone in right. this either. No, Remember you're not. Remember how earlier I said there was a difference between parapsychologists and ghost hunters? Well, one of the former, Dr. Andrew Nichols, co-received the only grant ever rewarded to study hauntings. He believes that the TV is also pushing questionable science and gave Salon a laundry list of reasons back in 2010. Here's a quote from that. Investigations always take place at night. Why would ghosts only come out then? How can you be a good observer in the dark? Investigators use unproven scientific seeming instruments like magnetometers, which have ultimately failed to produce replicable results. They suggest that every odd sound, every cold spot, and every orb, which has been explained away as side effects of digital cameras, are signs of ghosts. More generally, as Nichols puts it, they run around like little girls. Expectedly, there have also been accusations of fakery and exaggerations going on within these ghost hunting communities, and it's pretty obvious that some of these hunters are in it for all the wrong reasons. But surely, no one- Yeah. See, that's, it's crazy that they're hitting it right on the nose, man. And look, I used to have a lot of respect for ghost hunters. It really died down, unfortunately. My respect kind of died. And I got to say, the, the person who criticizes them, calling them little girls when everything, something happens, they start running and freaking out, even knowing they are there trying to debunk this shit or actually find answers, I feel is a genuine argument and a genuine point. It's like you guys are trying to be paranormal investigators it's a sort of science in a sense you got to try to find answers even if you have to like try to debunk the good shit that you are capturing on camera that is the purpose of a ghost hunter that is something i would have done in that situation with colby in that video when the door shut behind me and i freaked out i would have ran downstairs but then i would have went right back up and tried to debunk it because that would have made my chest pound too i'd been like oh okay I get it, 100%. That reaction was was understandable. I get it. But I would have went back and said, okay, that's an air conditioner. Let me sit in front of it for a few seconds and let me see if I can feel wind coming through it. That is what would have went through my mind. Now, again, if you if there is anything on Explore Club that goes dives into that more, let me know in the comments. I would really appreciate it. But until then, I'm not really deducting that as paranormal just yet. No one gets harmed by this silly little white lie. Right? Fakery and consequences. Okay. From trick strings on ghost hunters to mediums that communicate with ghosts that don't even exist, it's really no surprise that there's been some fakery going on. Even more common and annoying than that though, there are exaggerations. Between deciding to make this episode and actually researching and writing the script, Danny Gonzalez released a video called, I tried ghost hunting to see if it was fake. And honestly, I adore it. The entire time, Danny goes around on one of the most infamous haunted hotels, the Stanley Hotel right here in Colorado, and essentially debunks the experiences of other YouTubers and TV shows. Oh, you heard some weird noises at night? Yeah, Danny spoke with the staff and learned that they literally play pranks on one another and guests on a regular basis. One ghost hunting show said that all the uh -huh. unused old mattresses out back were mattresses that people died on. One of the staff told Danny that because they're a hotel, they're going to obviously have old mattresses laying around. And oh, a bunch of weird spots on a rug. Someone definitely urinated on that carpet because it's a hotel and people are gross. Yeah. I just appreciate Very the unbiased gross. and practical nature of his video because you're absolutely not going to find that in a lot of popular ghost hunting circles. Actual, genuine, trying to find the truth style ghost hunting doesn't really exist in a lot of these shows or videos anymore. Unfortunately One not. One of the YouTubers Danny brings up frequently is, and I don't like to bring him up, but Shane Dawson. 
And mm. while I know Shane has a whole massive laundry list of other controversies from the way he treats young girls to the way he's treated animals, let's just talk about the ghost hunting part, shall we? Okay, okay. Fair, the fair episode enough. of him ghost hunting in a haunted ship has over 30 million views. And Fuck. on Frank, it's all the exaggerated tropes about this genre rolled into one episode. A squeaking door and flickering lights elicit ill reactions, spooky music, and gasps of fear. A night vision camera having trouble focusing in a dim room is apparently scary, and Shane himself said he felt something, and that's indisputable. But once you get past introductions, every few minutes someone says, did you hear that, or did you feel that? When you stop and think about it- They're all so paranoid, man. When you go into these places, you, you're automatically paranoid, and that's, that's a problem, because that really can feed into your fear, and that could really feed into any small noise that you hear. Uh, you could be there and be like, did you hear that? Oh my gosh, like it could have been just literally like, I don't know, some creak on the floor off in the distance because it's an old building, right? And then all of a sudden people are like grabbing their hands and everything, like, oh, like they're just losing their shit. And you're like, all right, calm down, calm down. There could be an explanation for that. Every time I step, there's a creak. Could have been just me creaking and a board over there creaked. you like, calm down, calm down. It, it's true. There is a lot of people who over-exaggerate. It really is true. It really is. And I'm blunt about it and I'm sorry. I know that might piss a lot of people off. Critically, it's kind of laughable, but maybe that's all ghost hunters it are is. trying to be entertaining so then what's the actual harm you can say that about sam and colby too and a lot of these uh upbringing paranormal investigators is that they're they're trying to be entertaining too you got to be entertaining there's a reason you know you got to be yourselves and that's that's a good thing that's why i like about some of these uh youtubers is that they're, they're being themselves and they're having fun doing it and i i really got to respect that and it might be for those reasons and i might get hate for this that I don't find people like Sam and Colby overnight or anything like that to be some of the best paranormal investigators I've ever seen in my entire life. I, I'd prefer people who actually sat down and tried to figure out the real shit that's going on over people who who freak out at the smallest things and free, uh, trust me does not make their content any less entertaining. I still watch their content and I do buy some of the stuff that they find. I really do. I actually do find a lot of the things that they find, especially with the um, the Estes method. I find that shit to be very fascinating and very creepy. But not all the time will I sit here and acknowledge everything be to be paranormal with all their content. Arm of ghost hunters, if they're just trying to make a silly TV show to get you to believe in the paranormal for a few minutes. Well, firstly, there's the damage done to the parapsychologist. Those who do take this seriously and seek out actual scientific evidence now have a massive stigma associated with their field. Ironically, these ghost hunters supposedly trying to prove that ghosts exist have actually made it harder than ever for researchers to do exactly that. It's much more difficult for them to receive grants and gain academic positions. The field is considered a joke, largely, to because everybody's doing it. Yeah, TV shows have not helped. Harris Friedman, a professor at the University of Florida's psychology department, says that a file drawer problem has been created, which he describes as any negative findings being buried and only positive ones getting published. Apparently, as a doctorate student, he experienced that firsthand and was told that he wouldn't have an academic career if he published his study about children having a better chance of guessing cards when they didn't like each other. I'm not sure what this guessing entailed exactly, but the point remains the same. Ghost hunters that offer some semblance of proof are heard and popularized no matter how invalid or questionable that proof seems to be. Whereas those that are really studying in the field and trying to answer the age old question of are ghosts real in a scientific way are pushed aside. Phony ghost hunters, in my opinion, are literally damaging our ability to discover ghosts one day if they do exist. Some former ghost hunters have even been brought up on consequences you may not think about, like ignoring mental illnesses. Bray told CT Post that quote, We've had a lot of cases where we debunked paranormal activity and attributed it to a psychiatric issue, which was then taken around as a diagnosis by a psychiatrist. If we go in there and say that your paranormal activity is indeed paranormal and you have medical issues, not only could we be held liable for negligence, but we're enabling that mental illness for you, possibly making it worse and not helping. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure I would have considered this if it were not for this article, but he's got a point. It's wholly possible that some of the people calling these shows have serious undiagnosed mental illnesses, but instead of helping anyone, the shows are prioritizing profit. What if these guests go on to hurt it themselves happens. or others, or even just continue living in fear of a non-existent ghost because these ghost hunters were more concerned with their spirit boxes than getting to the root of what was actually happening? 
And that's a good possibility, too. Now, do I feel like sometimes a, psych- a psychiatrist will make up excuses because they just do not want to find, like, a reasonable explanation? Like, they can't find a reasonable explanation, so they'll try to figure out some way that there is a reasonable explanation? Absolutely. There are situations like that, too. And I, I do actually believe in those situations, too. I do believe in sometimes that there could be something wrong with somebody, and they might need to seek help. And 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 absolutely. But, like, it's vice versa with that situation. However... Yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot here, a lot of good information here, and I find it very fascinating. But there's far more to the downsides of ghost hunting as entertainment. In a mm. way, this industry is a crossroads between the true crime industry. Yeah, that is probably one of my biggest fucking, I don't care who you are. If you find Jeffrey Dahmer sexy because of what he did, I just get out of my face. Oh God, that that really kills me a little bit, yeah. Street and dark tourism, and at times it shares the same disgusting trait that they all do, exploitation. Now that's not to say yeah. that every ghost hunter is exploitative, but it's not all that hard to find those that are. As an aside, no, no. I do have an episode dedicated to dark tourism. I do have one talking about why serial killers are not sexy and to stop romanticizing them because you wouldn't believe it, but people do. And I- Unfortunately, you're right, they do. And I find that shit to be some of the most annoying it makes me want to lose my shit, we'll be actually. We'll out it's in annoying. the future with an episode about the true crime genre as a whole. One TV program called The Real Ghosts said that their in-house medium revealed new information about Lady Mo, the wife of a provincial deputy governor. The show suggested that her adopted daughter was a mistress of her husband because a medium said it. And since when did the words of a medium constitute as factual evidence? And it not only disrespected Lady Mo and her adopted daughter, but it also infuriated the local people of the area. Other ghost hunters have gone to Jeffrey Dahmer's former home to try and communicate with him. They've gone to plantations, asylums, anywhere where there's been tragedy and death. And this feeds directly into dark tourism and in my opinion, just profits off of other people's pain. Personally, if I saw ghost hunters go to a cemetery to speak with maybe one of my like dead loved ones and just try and speak to them or claim they did and then they say something, you know, of course weird because these shows don't actually know these people or anything about the history of them. I don't think I'd like that. What right do you no. have to use someone else's loss as a vehicle? Do you remember that whole uh, Illuminati? If you ever watched this, remember that whole incident with Madison Bell? Uh, she actually went missing 15 minutes around my house, actually, because it wasn't that far where she actually ended up just disappearing. And then the whole country like freaked out and were like looking for Madison Bell. You know, there was a lot of memes going around saying she was like the number one hide and seek player. Well, I actually watched a video from a psychic medium on YouTube because I was kind of fascinated at the time. And I watched a video and this psychic medium was 100% positive that Madison Bell was murdered by her mother and uh, her boyfriend because they had an affair and that she was buried on their property. And she was like, you need to send the dogs out there. You need to get the police over there. There is a body buried on that property. And then literally a few days later, Madison Bell calls home and says, oh, guys, I just ran away from home. And that, that psychic medium took down her video. I was about to rage on that shit. I was pissed. I was like, how could you do that? How could you fucking do that? And we live in a world where, yes, there are people who I actually do believe have an ability to actually see things that normal people can't. And I do believe that. But there are some people who will absolutely 100% profit off of that and that shit. Ah. Uh. Well, to make money. All in all, as they can be quite similar at times, I think one universal rule applies here. When watching these ghost hunting programs or partaking in dark tourism, it's important to ask yourself if you'd be okay with it if these hunters or tours spoke about you and your loved ones in the exact same manner. No, I wouldn't. If not, then maybe we need to rethink how ghost hunting is actually done. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going. I found that to be very true in a lot of cases. I I do believe, yes, that there are people on social media and everything who do fake this shit for views and money. I mean, you can make a lot of money with a video that gets over a million views. I could come out with the video tomorrow. Ghost throws my Pennywise uh, standee at my head and you see it fly at my head and hit. I could get a million views within a day. I almost should make that just for fun at this point. But no, it's it's a serious issue. I, I do agree. And I do I do find it to be. And that is why I am skeptical again, why I go into these videos kind of in the back of my mind. Like, OK, just keep this in mind, Jordan. Don't 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 fuck up. You know, don't believe everything you see. And as much as I really do want to believe, and as much as I really do want these to be real answers sometimes, sometimes it just comes in the back of my mind where I'm like, that's, I I don't know. So comment down below, guys. What did you agree with and what did you disagree with? I'm curious to hear your guys' opinions down below. Hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you're new to the channel. We are on our way to 20,000 subscribers. If you guys want to get us up there ASAP, it would mean so much. I will give more of my honest opinions and my honest reactions the bigger we get. So uh, until next time, guys, do keep it retro and please do take care and also support me on Patreon. 
and become a member. Uh, press the join button down below. It does mean a lot. I would love to get more names on that end credits list. You know what I'm saying?